it is, how much is enough? So how much is enough? Well, enough of what is the question. Is it enough that we have food every day? Is it enough that we have places to live? Is it enough that we can sit here in services in peace and safety? You know, day in and day out, we can't escape the realities of the world that we live in. We read in Daniel 12 and verse 4 this. It says, Seal the book until the end times when people will be going back and forth and they will be extremely busy and their knowledge will be increasing. So take a step back. Look at this scripture. Let's look at this scripture. Do we see how that applies to this time now? You know, people have always been continually learning, continually trying to improve whatever it is, you know, that's going on around them. We went through the Industrial Revolution. We've gone through the Atomic Revolution. But in all these things, has any of this made us happier? As a people, I'm talking. Has any of our technological advances brought peace, love, happiness, joy? We see just the opposite, right? You know, as we continue to grow, as we continue to get more sophisticated, it seems that people become more unhappier. Now, I just read an article, I think it was last night, in fact, the average American spends 177 minutes a day looking at their cell phones. That's three hours. Three hours a day, the average American spends on their phone. Now, the article pointed out that you know, the cell phone has, in some ways, replaced some TV time. Um, so, but that, that's an incredible amount of time that's being spent on you know, little gadgets. As the American people, God has blessed us incredibly, right? We have been protected in a bubble, you could say. But those days, they're drawing to an end. So as Christians, we claim to do differently than the world. We claim to think differently than the people around us. We claim that we are doing something different, <clears throat> excuse me, that causes a different outcome than what the world is experiencing. But how can we know if we are experiencing something different? My title was, How Much is Enough? And this is something that I had to really ask myself recently is, am I putting enough into prayer, into study, into meditation, occasional fastings? You know, as you see the world deteriorating, it's, it's cause for sobering thought for, to make you stop and, and take note of where you are at personally. And so as I was thinking about these things, there was really two realizations that I came to in this question, how much is enough? How much prayer, how much Bible study, how much meditation is enough? And the first thing that came to mind was balance. It has a lot to do with our approach. You know, we balance life, we balance our days, 
our time, family, responsibilities. We balance interactions with people in this world, friendships we may have with people. And at least it seems for me that there's just never enough time in a day. From, you know, getting up, getting everyone ready for school and work and getting out the door, going to work, coming home, picking everybody up, making dinner, spending some time with the family, and then studying. It's just a daily routine, right? We all have our individual daily routines, and each one is different. But the thing is to find balance in your life. Now we think about David, or excuse me, Daniel's custom, and he prayed, it says, three times daily. Now it doesn't say how long he prayed, but he made this part of his routine. We see that David's custom also was to pray a lot. It says that even in the midnight watches, he would get up and he woke up, he would think about God's way of life, and he would pray. He was also no stranger to meditation. We look at Proverbs and the Psalms, and we can see that these were deep thoughts that he was having, that he wrote down. And we can think about Paul, the Apostle Paul. Now, he wrote a lot of the New Testament, right? He was constantly helping the church. He was constantly doing his work as a minister. But we also read that he was a tent maker by trade. This means that he was actively busy working out in the building tents. Um, it's, you know, the, he had a very busy life as well. Let's turn to Acts 20 and verse 34. It says, Yes, you yourselves know that these hands, Paul's hands, have provided for my necessities and for those who are with me. Now, he did this on top of his duties of being a minister. But his attitude and his approach is what is so unique. He wanted to work. He wanted to show a good example. 1 Timothy 5 and verse 8. It says, But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So it's important to balance our lives, our time. You know, it's one thing for us to study for the sake of learning, for admonition and for growth. But it's another to study constantly with little regard for anything else. I think we all have known people who have spent their whole time, their whole lives, invested in studying the Bible, and yet their attitudes and their actions do not reflect or mirror what is stated in the Bible. They tend to think that their righteousness or righteousness will come from knowledge that they hold. But the Bible says that faith without works is dead. So others then can see how we live by the extension of our actions, what we take from the Bible and actually manifest. And then the second thought that I had was, was this. If you will turn to Proverbs 14 and verse 10. It 
And again, I'm asking, how can we know if we are putting enough in each day in regards to our relationship with God? How can we know if we are really preparing for and increasing in doing God's will for us individually? It takes spiritual application. Proverbs 14 and verse 10 tells us that our hearts, each and every one of our hearts individually, knows its own bitterness, and no one else can fully share its joy. Our relationship, individually, is a very personal thing. Now we can talk about our relationship with God with others. Maybe we can relate to others. We can share our thoughts and our feelings. But the fact is that no one knows me as well as I know me. And yet, even then, it says that God knows the deep things of our hearts. Even the things which we may not even be thinking ourselves but are in our hearts, God knows these things. Turn to 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 10. First Corinthians 2 and verse 10 and 11, it says, But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of man, which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. You know, without God's spirit, we can know ourselves to a certain extent. But with God's Holy Spirit, we should be able to tell a lot about ourselves from our feelings and from our thoughts. And these feelings and thoughts become our actions if we are indeed being led by God's Holy Spirit. Let's turn to Second Peter 1 and verse 4. First Peter 1 and verse 4, Peter says, By which have been given to us exceedingly and great promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Corruption because of evil desires. If we allow evil desires to fester, they obviously will breed all types of corruption. But it says that God has given us an escape from these through a promise. Let's read in verse 5. It says, But also for this very reason, give all diligence, add to your faith, virtue, and to virtue, knowledge. Let's stop right there for a second. Verse, it says, give all diligence. Some translations say, supplement your faith. Supplementing is something that completes or enhances something else when added to it. So Peter here is saying that we must do everything in our power, make every effort to enhance the things that he is going to continue to bring out. So let's continue in verse 5. For, and, but, for, excuse me, but also, for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, 
and to self-control, perseverance, and to per perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. Now, these traits can only come from God. If we are being obedient to God, we will have these traits. We will be working towards supplementing them into our lives. Let's continue in verse 8. It says, For if these things are yours, and abound, you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. If we do these things, we, will be, we won't be unfruitful, we won't be barren. So do these words resonate with us? Do we find them in ourselves when we look within? Let's continue in verse 9. It says, But he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness. And he has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Continuing on in verse 12, For this very reason... I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. Yes, I think it is right as long as I am in this tent to stir you up by reminding you. Lacking any of the characteristic traits that we just read puts us back in line with this world. But Peter says if we are doing these things with a full heart, with full zeal, then we will make our calling and election sure. We can't kid ourselves that these things will just come automatically because we come to church once a week. That somehow we're going to go ahead and be able to slip into the kingdom. It's rather something that we must want has to be a very real desire to cause us to bear these fruits in our lives. Now, God gives us the right mind and the right spirit. We see that Saul lost his Holy Spirit, and when that happened, he became distressed. He became emotionally unbalanced. He lost what God had given him at that time. Not everybody had the Holy Spirit at that time. 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 5 tells us to bring every thought into the captivity of Jesus Christ. That requires us to be living spiritually, to be seeking God's will in everything that we do. And as we see the world around us going crazy, we see them trying to make peace, but there is no peace. It's our duty and our responsibility not to get downhearted, but to remain zealous, to remain watchful. 1 Peter 1 and verse 13, chapter 4 and verse 7, chapter 5 and verse 8, each tell us to be alert, to be sober-minded, and to be continually ready. And so I had to conclude that it's not so much of an attitude of how much is enough, 
but it's rather an attitude of being able to stand firm. If you will turn to Ephesians 6 and verse 13. Ephesians 6 and verse 13, Paul says, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, 